Hello and welcome to the past, present, and future of striped bass, a Chesapeake perspective. My name is David Sikorsky and I'm the Executive Director of CCA Maryland, Coastal Conservation Association Maryland. I'm here in Cambridge, Maryland on the banks of the Choptank River, a really important place for striped bass. They're spawning grounds just upriver and in their juvenile stages they live amongst the oyster reefs and grass beds and marshes here in this important river. We're here building artificial reef habitat through CCA Maryland's Living Reef Action Campaign and it's because we want to give back. If we build habitat today, there will be fish tomorrow. That's what tonight's conversation is a bit about. It's about the current status of striped bass and how habitat and forage, their food fish, play into their life cycle and the future success or maybe failures of the population. In our last episode, we talked about the, the past, the moratorium, and so we're gonna cover a, a bit of what happened in management leading up to today, 2022 as we all tr wait to find out what's gonna happen this fall with the stock assessment and what future regulations might look like for striped bass in the Chesapeake and beyond. So Lenny, take it away with our great panel and folks get ready for a great and informative conversation. Welcome people, how you doing? I hope everyone's doing well. My name is Lenny Rudo. I'm the angler in chief at Fish Talk Magazine. I'll be your host tonight and more importantly for this conversation people, I'm a lifelong Chesapeake Bay Angler. Now, first off, we need to thank our partners for making all this possible. These are the organizations and companies that have stepped up to help support our recreational angling community here on the Bay. So thank you, CCA Maryland, Yamaha Wrightwaters, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, the American Sport Fishing Association, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, Boat US, and the Marine Trades Association of Maryland. And most importantly, I wanna thank you all. I wanna thank you for tuning in and taking your time to become a more involved, better educated angler. Look, the only way we can ever hope to improve our fisheries here on the Bay is if we have a strong fishing community that can speak up in an intelligent and civil manner. And we really hope that this will help with that. Now, this is our second installment. As Dave mentioned, we talked about the moratorium and the history of the fishery in the last one. If you missed it, don't forget, you can go to YouTube or you can go to Facebook. You can watch the entire episodes there. But tonight, we're going to talk about the current state of the striper fishery on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Zach, could you please pop up the ground rules real quick? And I should tell everybody, uh, Fish Talk's kayak angling guru and tech sharpie, Zach Dipmars is the guy behind the curtain here. He's going to be uh, popping everything up on screen. So real quick rundown. Uh, we want to know what you want to know. Please put your questions into the comments section. Section, Let them fly. We want this to be interactive. Now that said, let's try and keep our questions focused on the topic at hand. Keep them relevant to the time frame that's being discussed. And please be patient. It may take Zach a minute to grab that question and get it up on screen, or the conversation may vary a little bit. You know, it, it may change in direction, and Zach may have a really good question that we all want to hear about, and he may hold it for a moment or two before popping it up on the screen. So just be patient, hang tight. We're going to get to every single question that we possibly can. I can guarantee you that. Finally, Let's keep the conversation polite and civil. I can tell you, just as a matter of policy, anything involved with fish talk, uh, profanity is unacceptable. Any comments, including it, will immediately be deleted. We don't need that. Um, you know, the, the best way to get things done is to work as a team. And look, we're all on the same team. We all want the same thing. We all want better fisheries, more fish in the water, and more opportunity to go out there and go fishing for them. Now, here's the really good news. We have got a heavy hitting panel tonight. I mean, seriously, we have people who are serious science types and who are immersed in this topic 24 seven. First up, I want to introduce you all to Dr. Allison Colden. She is the Maryland Senior Fishery Scientist at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, a native of Virginia Beach. And Allison earned her doctorate in marine biology from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science that she is one person who is always working to give the critters of the Chesapeake Bay a seat at the table when policy is being discussed. Welcome, Allison. Thank you so much, Lenny. Happy to be here. Excellent. Now, we also have with us today, Mike Wayne, 
the Atlantic Fisheries Policy Director for the American Sport Fishing Association and an ASMFC Commission Senior Fishery Management Plan Coordinator. Whew, that's a mouthful. But folks, don't let those titles fool you. This guy is also highly educated in fishery science and conservation biology. He's got a master from NC State. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Lenny. Happy to be here as well. Awesome. Now, the next member of our panel is Pat Gear from the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. He's a chief of fisheries management, and he too is a marine scientist with a master's in biological oceanography from Old Dominion University. He holds a number of roles with the ASMFC and also happens to be an avid kayak angler. So, <laughs> Pat, I know you and, and uh, Zach are going to have some stuff to talk about, right? You certainly will, and I've had a lot of conversations with Chris Chris already about that, so glad awesome. to be here. Awesome. All right, well, let's jump right into it, people. And the first question, I want to direct at you, Allison. Um, I want to get the conservation standpoint, and right from the get-go, I'm going to throw you a curveball. It's a tiny, tiny little curveball. Don't worry. Tiny little curveball. Uh, we're talking about the current status of the striper fishery, right? And I want you to give us your view of the broad picture on that. But first, I want to know if you can boil it down to one word or just a phrase to really kind of take it all down to its core. What is this current status of the striper fishery in the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, to boil it down to one word, I would say caution. Um, based on the latest stock assessments that have come out of ASMFC, um, you know, our, our spawning stock biomass, the, the total weight of our, our female spawning fish is lower than we want it to be. Our reproduction is lower than where we want it to be. And so I think uh, a lot of the folks who are listening in tonight are probably avid anglers who have been um, feeling all of these changes and regulations that have been happening over the past couple of years. And uh, I want everybody to know that all of that is coming from this place of caution uh, where we have seen some some red flags, some orange flags, maybe um, in the latest information from ASMFC on the population status of striped bass. Well, I know all those anglers out there are feeling it. I'm feeling it myself, and I think the general community as a whole probably thinks you know caution is probably a pretty good way to look at this. Uh, let's take it to Mike. Mike, from your standpoint. Um, you know, from the recreational fishing community standpoint, how do you see the current state of the striper fishery? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm excited that Allison didn't take my word. I, I'm calling it rebuilding. That's my word for the striper fishery. <clears throat> um, the population has been in decline for quite a while. Uh, the managers have been trying to address that decline with various regulation changes. Um, and angling and fishing um, is at an all-time high. You know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was people put down their cell phones, they didn't have to commute as much, and they got us outdoors, which is great for the outdoor economy and specifically the sport fishing industry. So <clears throat> it's just a matter of can we still provide fishing access while remaining um, having a conservation mindset for the striped bass resource. Uh, I think we're headed in that direction. Um, hopefully we get some help from mother nature, uh, with some stronger recruitment year classes. That's all related to water quality. We're going to get into that later, but yeah, generally speaking, I think the striped bass fishery is huge, not just in the Chesapeake, but coastwide from North Carolina through Maine. Uh, people love catching rockfish, as they say, in Chesapeake and stripers along the coast and up into New England. And there's just something about this species that drive anglers. Um, a lot of them catch and release. Some harvest the fish to take it home to eat. So we've got a, a diversity of anglers in this fishery and uh, a lot of passion behind it. Yeah, there is no doubt about it. And I want to say, Mike, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I hate to say anything nice about COVID. But it did get a lot of people out fishing. And from my perspective, what I see as a result of that is a stronger fishing community. It gives us a bigger voice, a bigger seat at the table. 
So next, let's take this Wait, question. Lenny, over. Sorry, Lenny, can I just jump in? You just sparked another. So not, it, not only stronger fishing community, but also a lot of anglers don't know this, but um, there's an excise tax on fishing equipment and um, fuel and sorry, boat fuel. And that money gets distributed to the states for conservation. So anglers are directly contributing to conservation. And we've seen that fund, that um, Sport Fish Restoration Fund grow greatly in most recent years because of that increase in participation. So um, I just wanted to add that that does add conservation value specifically in dollars and cents. Nice, that's awesome. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, Pat, before we take this question and put the ball in your court, I wanna point out something. I just wanna point out one thing here because in many ways, Virginia has a little bit of a different outlook on the fishery than Maryland, right? It's mm -hmm. a little bit different. And we both love our neighbors. I love Virginians, Virginia loves Marylanders, right? But we also kind of beat each up, beat each other up sometimes on this. And you know, if you think about it, Virginia has really been a little more forward thinking in a lot of ways on the striper front. You guys, you know, you have a shorter season, you have a tighter slot, you eliminated the trophy season um you know give us your viewpoint what are you seeing maybe that you know maybe helped initiate these changes well i, I think the word i would use would be troublesome in in mm -hmm. virginia i mean it's we've seen you know our share of the coastwide recreational harvest go from nearly 20 percent down to less than three percent and uh we took those proactive measures because we had you know we had a secretary who was you know very in tune to, you know, fisheries. He had a fisheries background and, you know, talking to him, we all, we were all in agreement that, you know, we needed to do something. And we actually put our regulations in place before addendum six was completed. I think we, we had everything in place. We, we did away with our trophy fishery and we, we um, uh, reduced our bag limit, I think in August prior, you know, prior to ASMSC approving it. I'm, I'm glad that we didn't have to do anything else because I was at that meeting sweating. I'm like, oh my God, what, what what's going to happen if, if they make us do more and we've already done our regulations. But it's, um, you know, it, it's it's concerning that the spawning stock is is not where we want it to be. Um, you know, uh, the Maryland the Maryland and VIMS striped bass surveys, the, the juvenile recruitment numbers have been below average for a number of years and we're relying on just you know, one or two year classes in there. And it's like, so, so there's a lot of concern. And, um, you know, I, we sat on a number, you know, I sat on the workshop that was looking at uh, Amendment 7 and what should be in Amendment 7, 7 and whether or not you agree with what went in it or not. It was good, good to hear a lot, everybody's perspective on, you know, that, yeah, there is concern there, that, you know, everyone's feeling the same that we need to, we need to do something to protect this valuable resource so, and do it now. So Zach, if you've got that uh, graph handy, showing the spawning success or lack thereof over mm -hmm. the last few years. I forget what the slide number was, but we do have a graph on that somewhere. Um, the last three years in particular, correct me if mm -hmm. I'm wrong. They, I mean, they've been downright yeah, worrisome. Yeah, it's been down. That's Maryland's. And I think, I think Virginia's has been a little bit better than that. That's, that's, that's a, that's not the spawning. That's not the, you want to we see the it. same survey? We, we had it the first right time. You had it. You had it. <laughs> The Maryland Young of Year graph, the purple yeah. bar chart. Right, which which I'm going to guess a lot of the folks watching tonight have probably seen this yeah. at one time or another. It's a fairly familiar graph. We see the big giant spikes that really, in large part, gave us some great fishing for a long time. But uh, the last three years are utterly dismal, and really the last six years are not what you'd call great, right? So maybe this is a good time to segue right into the habitat thing. Um, Allison, let's circle back with you real quick here. Uh, dead zones, runoff, oysters, grasses. What's the big picture on the rockfish's habitat in the Chesapeake Bay? Well, rockfish habitat, I think you, I think you hit it on the head right there throughout the entirety of the striped bass life cycle. And we've got a graphic of this too, if Zach is quick on the trigger. 
um, is that the point is that striped bass are using all parts of the Chesapeake Bay at various points throughout their life cycle. They're using the main stem, they're using the tributaries, they're going up the rivers to spawn at the salt wedge. So it's really important for striped bass to have good habitat in all of these areas, you know. Um, otherwise, it's going to be challenging either to the reproductive success if the issues are up in the tribs or to the survival of the spawning stock if we've got issues going on in the main stem. So because the striped bass is so, you know, inextricably linked to the Chesapeake Bay and not just any one portion of it, but all of it, the main stem, the tributaries um, and offshore, it's important that we've got quality habitat in all of these areas. And so there's a lot of things that are really challenging that. You hit a couple of them on the head. Um, the Chesapeake Bay has lost a lot of its structured habitats over time that are really important, not only directly to striped bass, but to also their prey species. These are things like oyster reefs, wetlands, seagrass habitats. A lot of those are things that have been lost over time. And we're dealing with um, a, an ecosystem in the Bay that has fundamentally changed um, from what it used to be 100 years ago or what it used to be even 50 years ago. And we'll get a, into this a little bit more later, I think, but we can all um, expect more changes to come with climate change and all of the effects associated with that. And, um, you know, it's really impacting the availability of habitat. And I just want we mentioned all the structured habitats already, the wetlands, the, the oyster reefs, but also I want people to remember and understand that the, the water quality itself defines the amount of mm -hmm. habitat available for, for stripers in the bay as well. It's not just the structured habitats, it's where is the water temperature right for them? Where is the dissolved oxygen sufficient to support striped bass, um, you know, staying there comfortably um, and not struggling or being stressed physiologically. So these are all really important things. Some of them we we can influence or have some sort of control over through our actions uplands and and what's going on to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. And some of them are a lot harder for folks to influence or control. There are things like decadal oscillations in, in weather and climate that influence a lot of the um, a lot of the issues with the life cycle or with the prey species that striped bass depend on. So um, I'll, I'll open it up with that. And I'm sure we'll dig in a lot more to, to yeah. some of the issues that we just laid out. I'm, I'm kind of shocked because I actually think I know what you meant by decadal oscillations. <laughs> that's, that's a big, woo, man, that's something else there. Uh, so Zach, if you can grab, I think we had a graphic on the, the squeeze you were talking about where the, the, the fish are kind of stuck in an area mm -hmm. because of temperature, uh, oxygen content. Maybe we, there we go. So now I, I want to ask a real specific question here. I, this is not on the agenda, people. But as we look at this, this just really brings something to mind. We've heard for several years in a row now that one of the reasons why all the rockfish have been north of the Bay Bridge is that they're stuck in this squeeze, right? And once they're up there, they kind of can't get out. But this year we had a really cool June. June was not super hot. So why didn't the fish move around? Why, why did they still apparently sort of get stuck up there? Does anybody know? Well, I, I don't know specifically about the conditions this year, but I can tell you a lot of what is going to determine where these fish are is not just temperature, but also that dissolved oxygen piece. Mm -hmm. So on the graphic here, you can see the habitat squeeze refers to when the summer water temperatures are hot at the surface, they're higher than what striped bass really want to tolerate or higher than what would cause stress. Um, that's about 82 to 83 mm -hmm. degrees water temperature and um, the low oxygen levels on the bottom. So in the summertime when we have these massive algae blooms that aren't able to be grazed down because we've lost our oysters and our menhaden and a couple of other filter feeders, um, that sinks down to the bottom where the bacteria break it down and that's what causes our low oxygen dead zones. But striped bass typically want four milligrams per liter or more dissolved oxygen on the bottom. And so if you have areas where, you know, the water temperature is suitable, but the low, but the oxygen is not, then they're still probably not going to be hanging out in that area. And so there's some great information um, that Maryland Department of Natural Resources, um, I'm sure BMRC has an equivalent, but in Maryland, we're very fortunate to have the Eyes on the Bay program. 
Um, and basically, you know, what some of the recent years have shown, not this year in particular, but if we take a particularly warm year, for example, like 2019, in Maryland, there was only 3% of Maryland's waters that were considered suitable habitat mm -hmm. uh, for striped bass. And so if you imagine there's only 3% of uh, all of Maryland waters that are, are comfortable for striped bass in terms of temperature and DO, you can imagine they're all going to be trying to cram in there and hang out together in that 3% area. That's interesting. 3%. I never heard that figure. That is frankly sad. That's sad. Uh, but let's take this question over to Pat, because Pat, as a fisheries manager, like you're looking at it from, from a different challenge, a different perspective. I mean, is there anything that you folks in your position, like, is there anything you can even do about this situation? Well, I mean, you know, I, I want to say is this, I was a scientist for 14 years when I worked at VIMS and we did study, you know, we did extensive studies on DO and there's, there's areas like in the mouth, for example, the mouth of the Rappahannock where those low DO levels are not only at depth, but all the way into shallow water as well, you know, into like three or four feet of water, you're getting low DO levels. And so it makes it makes certain portions of the river almost impassable. Um, but as a manager, it's kind of hard. I mean, what what can you do? It's 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 um, you know it, it, it's it you know I I really as a you know I'm not sure what we could do. It's just, other than you know it's we can't control the temperature. We can't you know we can't control the the climate. Um, you know, so that's it's kind of difficult in that regard. Is how how we can manage that other than you know you know, identifying those areas so people know, know about them. And if, they're, if they want to go fishing in those areas, you know, let them know that there's not going to be anything in there. So, but there's yeah. plenty of, you know, there's plenty of areas where I've done plenty of trawling in the Chesapeake Bay and you, you, you could bring the net up and you know, if it, you know, if the DO is below point, you know, two, uh, uh, 2.0, because there's nothing in the net. It's just, it's pretty much just a dead zone. Mm, major bummer. Uh, Mike? Let's get the sport fishing community view on this. Is this something that you guys work on? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> generally the sport fishing community obviously cares a ton about about habitat. We heard, heard excuse me, uh, Dave Sikorsky talk about that in his opening. And um, CCA Maryland does a lot of reef building. I'm sure CBF participates in a lot of that as well. Um, and as an angler, we all know, like, where do we go to catch fish? It's around the habitat. Um, you know, not a lot of people know this, but the species name Sac Saxatillus for striped bass means amongst rocks. So that's where the rockfish names, name comes from. And so it's like part of the striped bass Latin name is a habitat reference and so it's it's really important, obviously, as Allison pointed out and Pat complimented, it this is a an issue that is monitored. It's something that we need to learn more about and know more about. Water quality is a huge plays a huge role. Um, you know, I was looking at in preparation for this discussion, I was doing a little look and in, looking into the research to figure out like what what is it that drives young of year success? Because I had always heard from, you know, legends like Gary Shepard from the Northeast Science Center, like, oh, it's rainy years produce cool stronger. Years. Yeah. And um, I found a few papers that say it's really linked to phytoplankton production and turbidity. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's that was really interesting. Like, we can't control a lot of that right and the climate is changing and so that's why in my in my previous statement i was saying you know hopefully we get some help from mother nature that creates a good environmental condition to give us stronger year classes because we do need them i mean the the history of striped bass the resource has taught us that it's really dependent on strong year classes and, and that makes sense, right? You can't have a lot of adult fish without a lot of juveniles and babies. So, um, yeah, habitat plays such an important role, and I'm glad that we're digging in on it. Yeah, you know, Mike, just for the record, I would like to personally thank you for explaining why Marylanders and Virginians have the rockfishes name correct 
And all those people up north who call them straight bass have it wrong. This easy, <laughs> easy, Lenny, easy. Well, I do want to jump in here real quick, Lenny, because there have been a lot of things, and I'll admit there are a lot of things that we've discussed so far that that we have very little control over or is such a you know global issue that it seems overwhelming. Um, but I, I wouldn't be a, a proper employee of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation if I didn't mention that there are things that we can do, um, but it may not fall within the purview, Pat's purview, per se, yeah. in the traditional fisheries management sense. Yeah, Pat, working with, at VMRC or folks at DNR, there are a f very few levers that you guys can can pull, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be focusing on reducing pollution reaching the Chesapeake Bay that's driving, you know, these harmful algal blooms, driving the hypoxic dead zones in the summertime. Um, I think folks need to understand and make those connections that the fishing and the habitat that's available for striped bass really starts upstream. Um, you know, some people are really aware of that, but like, you have to understand that maybe your fishing opportunities depend a lot more on the fertilizer you put on your lawn than you typically realize. Um, and those are things that people are working on. The states are working on under the Chesapeake Bay watershed agreement. We also have to figure out though, that that is, that is a whole water Chesapeake Bay watershed wide problem. And it's going to change a lot more slowly uh, than some of the management changes that, that Pat and others can make in the short term. So I think some of these things we can influence, but we have to recognize the difference in time scales on which these these types of actions work. I wish they were quicker. We just got the Chesapeake Bay report card and it's just, man, when you look at it over the long term, it's like a flat line, which I guess in some senses is kind of not horrible because that flat line has not gone down as our population has gone up, as our impervious surfaces have gone up as they've knocked all the trees down to build stuff. I mean, you know, you can just add it on one thing after the next. So man, habitat can be a kind of a depressing. <laughs> yeah. Lenny, one of the things we can, you know, as a manager that we can do is try to work on habitat restoration projects, whether it be, you know, through wallop row and some of our other funding sources, we fund, you know, the, the SAV work at VIMS, the restoration and the monitoring um, oyster restoration projects. I don't think we're funding any of those off SFR, but we have a pretty strong oyster program. But also, you know, oyster balls, you know, uh, like Dave Sikorsky's doing. I mean, we, we've been trying to get involved with that as well. So, you know, trying to build habitat, you know, th that's something that management agencies can do and are involved with, you know, especially with sport fish restoration money, because that can be going towards some of the funding can be going for habitat restoration. And should be going towards it, I would argue. Yeah. I would argue. Um, you know, let's take this right to forage uh, while you're up, Pat, because I got a, yeah. a pretty specific question for you. Because we hear, uh, I mean, you're you're hip deep in this issue, right? All day. It, it, right. <laughs> it's never anything for you. Um, and up until now, the rockfish, along with everything else, have kind of been managed in their own little silos, right? Mm -hmm. And we keep hearing about this ecosystem approach. So first, I want you to nutshell for us what exactly is an ecosystem approach, and then maybe... Tell us if things have shifted in that direction from where you sit. Um, I think we should be tag teaming this, but I think it's like, you know, the approach is that, you know, like you said, the, the species don't live in a silo and there's interactions between each species. So, um, you know, the, the ecosystem approach that we, we've developed recently, we, recently with ASMSC was about a 10-year process to, to develop it. And I think it just got approved in 2000, October 2020, I think is what it was. I, I'm getting lost with our COVID dates. But, uh, um, and, you know, it, it did find some strong relationships. It looked at a number of species, you know, you know with striped bass. And there was a, a good relationship with Manhattan, not, not so much with uh, croaker or, or uh, bluefish. And I think it was one other species, um, weakfish maybe. There were a couple, the, the relationship wasn't as strong. But, you know, we know there's a strong relationship with that. And, and using that modeling, coming up with, you know, ecological reference points, which are, instead of biological reference points, which takes into account, you know, um, a species importance, not only as, as a, you know, as a 
fisheries product, but also as, as, as its ecological benefit. And, you know, that's what Menhaden is. It has an ecological benefit as well. So, and, and just recently with, um, as a result of that eco, uh, ecological reference um, assessment they did, the modeling, uh, ASMFC, you know, lowered as a precautionary approach, lowered the, the TAC for the whole coast uh, about 10% as, as a starting point on that. So I think that was a, it was a huge step. It took, you know, a lot of years to get done. It was on a coastwide basis, which I'd rather see that, you know, I'd, li I'd like to see those measures trying to be moved forward to the Chesapeake Bay and have some, you know, spatially specific, but I think that's, you know, a long time coming from now. So what I'm getting from you is yes, management is moving in that direction general rule of thumb, but I'm still not, I'm not sure I have my head wrapped around what it is. Maybe Allison, is this something, maybe you can just make it simple for us. And maybe at the same time, as you're doing that, maybe Zach, you can find that graph that showed the relationship between bunker and rockfish. Allison, one word, one word, one word, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> for ecological reference points, connections. Connections. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, but basically, ecological reference points uh, try to try to recognize that species are connected. So prior to ecological reference points, uh, we manage with what's called, as Pat said, biological reference points. And that means we look at how many striped bass are there and set the harvest based on how many striped bass can be taken out. We look at the menhaden and see how many menhaden are there and, and take out however many menhaden we think would be sustainable not taking into account that striped bass also need to be feeding on those menhaden. And so when you look at those two things in their separate silos, species by species, you're missing the connection that striped bass and menhaden have. And it's striped bass, not just menhaden, there's other forage species that are important as well. But for ASMFC, this was a primary focus on developing the ecological reference points for Menhaden with striped bass as one of its most important connections um, was what the food web modeling determined. And so the graph that you guys are seeing on the screen right now is basically showing that the striped bass biomass is influenced by the amount of Menhaden harvest that happens. So um, it's showing that there is a dependence of striped bass on menhaden. And as you increase the menhaden harvest, the amount of striped bass biomass, the total weight of fish that can be supported in the ecosystem declines down to sort of a plateau as you increase the menhaden harvest. So point of this graph is just to show, I think what a lot of anglers already know is that predators and their prey are connected, but predators and prey and their prey are connected in important ways through fishing. Um, I think is is the point here. And if you were um, had a goal of rebuilding the striped bass population uh, it, based on this graph, and you were harvesting menhaden out to a level that's listed as 1.1, 1.2 on this graph, you are not going to be able to reach uh, that high level of striped bass biomass because of the interdependence of striped bass on Menhaden. And so there you would you would see in reality what would play out is a mismatch between the goals for the striped bass fishery and the fishing levels in the Menhaden fishery. And now that we have ecological reference points for Menhaden at ASMFC, those two things are linked directly. Um, and so we have goals for the striped bass fishery and the Menhaden is now being managed, the harvest is being managed to a level that it will um, you know, hopefully support those rebuilding goals for the striped bass fishery. Now, you know, I, I remember we talked about in the last episode, we talked about how uh, when the moratorium went in, there were actually tons and tons of bunker. Like they had a really good, might have been decadal oscillation. I'm not sure, something like that. Uh, but they were really, you know, they had really strong numbers back then. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, um, I certainly don't see the bunker numbers the way I did when I was a kid, but I got to also wonder about crabs. We just got a really low crab count. I got to wonder about spot. You know, it seems like everybody and their brother is catching a bunch of spots, sticking them in a live well, sticking them on a hook, and then trying to feed them to the rockfish. Do these other species, you know, does, should we be worried about this? So, so some of this stuff, sorry, I jumped in on you, Pat. Um, some ahead. of this stuff, some of the research that's out there is really interesting um, because for, especially for these forage species, which are feeding on the microscopic plants, the phytoplankton, the microscopic, um, you know, animals, the zooplankton, they are really much closer to a lot of the environmental drivers 
of of productivity in the Chesapeake Bay because they are they are down on the bottom of the food chain for the most part. Things like Menhaden, Spot, Silversides, Bay Anchovies, and some of the work that has been done through the Bay Program, the Fish, the Forage Action Team. Um, is showing that there are interesting correlations between t- some of these species. Menhaden spot and silver sides are one of them that tend to fluctuate together. So when Menhaden are down, spot tend to be down as well, as well as silver sides. And, um, you know, those are primarily, they think, environmental drivers. So the way that the environment is interacting um, is supporting either high abundance, and those three species are tending to move together, or low abundance. So not too shocking, Lenny, that you would say that you're anecdotally seeing fewer menhaden and fewer spot because those are two species that tend to fluctuate together. Um, I'll stop there and let Pat jump in, but I do want to get back to to some of the possible shifts that we might be observing related to changes in, in water quality in the Chesapeake Bay and maybe some climate related shifts in species distribution. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought 10, 10 or 15 years ago, we would be creating regulations for spot, you know, at ASMFC. And, and we, you know, and then we, we've created a traffic light analysis approach to look at it and go, yeah, okay, that's great. Cause you know, we're never going to use it. And then lo and behold, a few years later, it's like we're, we're, we're hitting all the triggers and we're having to go ahead and create management actions where now, you know, I think it's um, 50 fish per, you know, per person per species. And that might go lower cause it's, uh, they're going to hit the trigger again. So, um, you know, it's um, croaker, croaker have been low as well, you know, and it's, you know, somebody at one of the, one of the ASMFC meetings, as we, as we sat there talking about what we were going to do about croaker, they said, well, is this going to be another weak fish where it's, it's natural mortality and there's nothing we can do. You know, we think it's all natural mortality that's affecting it. And we don't know, you know, what we can, what we're going to be able to do to protect it. So, uh, Allison, before we jump back into some of those bigger picture items, which I want to jump to in just a minute, I want to get Mike's take on this because, Mike, you have some real insight into the fishing community, the fishing businesses. Um, how do you see it? Because there's actually a little bit of a, not a controversy, but but there are two sides to this coin because if you can, you know, Let's take spot, for example. Some guys like to go fishing for spot. Well, if you're cutting them down for rockfish, I mean, how does that shake out? How do you see the argument playing out? Yeah, so, uh, gosh, I was thinking so much as I was listening to Allison and Pat talk, you know, and what was going through my head is like, when I go out fishing, what do I look for? I look for fish breaking on the surface, feeding on some type of forage, and I look for the birds that are in on the action as well. And so... Um, the, the word that came to my mind was assimilation, assimilation of that energy into uh, the system. And that occurs at the lowest level, as Allison was talking about. And the forage species are, are an, a really important link there. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, where is the sport fish community on this? Um, I think anglers really comprehend that conservation of our forage species is very important, especially for the species that we all like to catch recreationally. And rockfish is a great example. Um, You know, there's different, there's obviously a wide range of opinions. I'll give you ours. We, We were really supportive of the reductions taken on the striped bass fishery to help rebuild this population. And you know, part of that is what more can we do as a community? Remember, we're all in this together, right? All of us benefit from the resource. What can we all do to work together? And so I think it makes sense to take equally a conservation mindset on the forage base as well. Um, And so what more can managers do to make sure that there's enough forage in the water um, to feed the ecosystem and specifically our recreational species. So um, <clears throat> the ecosystem approach to management was huge. It took a really long time, a lot of work, a lot of science. You know, it's, it's really hard. We know those connections exist, right? We're on the water. We're seeing a big fish eat a little fish, a striper eat a menhaden. We're seeing that. But what is that relationship 
in terms at the population level? And what does it look like specifically spatially in the Bay? Like these are really challenging questions to answer. We're headed in that direction. I know everybody wishes it was going more quickly, but that's the challenge. And so in the absence of all of those answers, we're, we're making a push to act more conservatively on the forage. And so that, I, I really feel like the anglers have rallied around that. Um, I don't see this as a commercial versus rec issue. Again, remember, everyone benefits from uh, the resource. And so we're all in this together. Like, what can we all do to build it all back um, to a, to the place that it was and, and have it be the, the iconic fishery that we know rockfish can be? So um, I don't know if that specifically answered your question, Lenny, but that was what was going through my head when I was listening to Pat and Allison talk, and I just wanted to get that out there. So thanks for giving me that opportunity. Yeah, that pretty much does, but it also segues beautifully into Allison's bigger point. So maybe you want to take it away from there. I mean, is, is it even possible to have the fisheries that, you know, we became accustomed to a decade ago? with the changes we see taking place what's what's going on great yeah. question yeah so i think there's a couple of things that we have already seen happening um and a couple of things that we are likely to expect to see um you know for example they we've already observed uh an av increase in the annual average temperature in the chesapeake bay of about 1.3 degrees um, the Chesapeake Bay is warming up faster than the Atlantic Ocean, which is not necessarily surprising. We're kind of like a small bathtub in comparison. Um, and that's going to affect the temperature alone. We won't even need, don't even need to get into, you know, the changes in stream flow and the timing of the phytoplankton blooms. But the temperature alone is going to start to impact things. We already looked at our habitat squeeze diagram. How is that going to change the availability of habitat? Um, warmer water can uh, hold less oxygen than cooler water. So as those temperatures increase, it's going to exacerbate some of the issues that we are concerned about with low oxygen conditions. And um, as sea levels rise, we could see that salt wedge habitat moving or changing uh, where those striped bass are spawning. Um, we may also see changes in precipitation patterns. If those are going to happen, um, you know, earlier in the spring, maybe that helps with some of that striped bass reproduction, which we talked about earlier is, is typically better in wetter um, spring time, or is the temperature going to cancel that out? There's a lot of questions out there about how these varying effects are going to sort of even out over time. Is it going to be positive? Is it going to be negative? Um, I think a lot of folks are wondering right now if, if you're following Menhaden, uh, and what's going on at ASMFC or or just in the news. There's a lot of Menhaden in the New England states. They're seeing a huge amount of biomass up there. There's a question of, is it more production? Is it just um, the species expanding its range? Or, you know, is that a shift in distribution of where those fish are going to be? And I think that remains to be seen. But obviously, the Chesapeake Bay is still an important um an important uh, spawning area and nursery habitat for striped bass. So if we start to see one of their main forage species shifting their distribution, we have to consider how that is going to, um, you know, affect the striped bass as they're coming into the bay to feed and to spawn. Very interesting. Now, the one thing that Allison did mention was, I was just going to say one thing Allison did mention, she kind of alluded to it a little bit, but, you know, we, we're getting these, uh, you know, expansion of species like red drum. I mean, red drum is a species that has always been in the Chesapeake Bay, but not in the numbers we're seeing now. I mean, and, you know, they're they're pretty much to the point where you know we're seeing juvenile we're seeing you know juveniles in uh, age one fish almost year round, which was a little unusual. So you know, and, and they're they're major predators as well. So it's like we're seeing these shifts of you know some larger species as well. I can tell and you, and we've that, got yeah. a shrimp fisheries. That, yes. and, you, know, you, you can thank me for that. So. <laughs> Pat, I'm sure you know this, but, we, you know, at Fish Talk, we were getting reports in February of guys who were going out red drum fishing with regularity inside the bay. Now, all the way down at the mouth, but inside the actual bay. And they were catching fish. Yeah. And all that, I was like, wow, man, I got to jump on the car and drive down there. So that's pretty cool 
but that definitely is a big shift. It's really not not something, you know, that certainly that I ever remember seeing. So I want to remind everybody at this point, if you got questions, plug them into the comments. Zach, if you got some reader questions you're holding, or I'm sorry, viewer questions you're holding, go ahead and start popping them up there. And I also want to open up the table here and ask Allison, Pat, Mike, has this conversation brought up any questions in your mind that you'd like to ask one of the other panelists? Any takers? Go ahead, Mike. You look like you got you got you ready to well, say something. Not necessarily to the panelists, but I've been keeping my eye on the comments and I see some good questions in there. Um, I was actually trying to answer some of them in the chat, but I did, couldn't figure out how to do that. So Lenny, happy to take some questions from the comment section. Um, and I am sure that will sp spark some more discussion mm -hmm. from I'm, the from all I'm, of us. I'm wondering if the Wizard of Oz is having technical difficulties because usually those questions come flying <laughs> up on the screen and you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But if you so got one where you're looking I'm at- I'm gonna just, yeah, I'm just gonna start yeah. up at the Take top it. and I'm not I'm not playing favorites here. Um, <clears throat> it's just one that, so the question is, do you have a composite striped bass index which combines Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, YY indices? So Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the recruitment modeling that occurs yes. in the assessment is a composite index. Yeah. And so we've, we've, uh, I think we only showed the Maryland index, but right. um, there's also, if you go to the ASMFC website and click on striped bass, you can see the composite recruitment index there as well. Um, we, I don't think we have it in our slides, but I don't think we have that. No. It's pretty easy to yeah. find um, on the ASMC webpage, and if you can't, feel free to reach back out. But yeah, that is a composite posit index. All the indices go into the modeling framework, and <clears throat> the model produces a uh, composite estimate of recruitment. Well, I got a follow-up <laughs> question on Kevin's question. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully someone has seen this. Are are the northern states showing any uptick as as we're having these dismal years? It's a really good question. Um it's it's yeah. coming up a lot, of course, with the conversations on climate that everyone has been having. Um gosh, I, I don't even know if I want to say this on a Chesapeake um seminar, but some have said, um, is there going to be, <clears throat> is the Hudson River spawning stock going to be a larger contributor to the population moving forward? That's been some speculation. I think it's reasonable, reasonable speculation. Um, you know, we should pick up, we, the, the, Juvenile survey should be able to pick up on that trend. I mean, you saw the Maryland figure. You know, it it, it there's a lot of volatility there. There's a lot of variability, yeah. so it will take some time to pick up on that trend. But that has absolutely been discussed around the table, and I think it's to be seen. Um, you know, wh what that shift actually looks like and what the contributions of the, the spawning stocks are. And it's the striped bass life history that makes this so unique, right? You have the big producer areas. And so if there is a shift to the north, it would be logical that those more, that those more northern stocks would contribute more to the spawning stock. And then well, how does that impact sort of the, the migration patterns and the distribution of those fish. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I still think the Chesapeake Bay is going to be mission critical for striped bass. Absolutely. But I do think there will be some sort of a shift to the north. Well, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but we have seen the southern spawn kind of tailing out, right? North Carolina has been crying mm -hmm. the blues for years now. Yep, yeah, they continue. This, sorry, Pat, I didn't mean to jump in over you, but the North Carolina um, program continues a stocking effort to try to supplement natural reproduction in some of the more southern rivers. And then the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River stock has seen very poor recruitment lately mm -hmm. um, in that system. And that 
historically speaking, it's not included in the migratory stock. It does contribute, I think, a little bit, but not enough to really be considered part of that migratory stock. <clears throat> But it was a naturally reproducing population. And so to see those numbers down is is not a great sign. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say that's indicated in, in the landings too, the commercial and the recreational harvest. It's it's almost non-existent in North Carolina. Hmm. I, I remember 30 years ago going to North Carolina to catch rockfish. <laughs> as crazy as that may sound. Yeah, now they're looking at like a a one week or two week season for the Roanoke fishery. And it's, that's a, it's a bummer because there's a lot of anglers, especially inland anglers that rely on that mm. fishery and really enjoy participating in it. Um, so it's sad to see those seasons get so shortened. Um, so there are, I think pretty much, you know, coastwide, a lot of people are feeling the impacts of the population decline. And so that's what makes the rebuilding all that more important, but we're going to need some help from the environment. So everybody, hopefully can do what they do their part, you know, treat the resource with respect. Everyone plays a role here down to the individual, down to the folks using fertilizer on their lawns. Like I've seen a lot of anglers uh, cue into that. So um, it all, it all plays a role here. Sorry. I, I'll, I'll be quiet for a little. No, that's fine. You know, it, it, it's funny because I go around and pick the weeds out of between the concrete instead of spraying the weed killer. And it's always driven me nuts. I remember when they had, I think they were spraying for West Nile virus up north and then they figured out they killed all the lobsters. Yep. Isn't that a thing? And, and I really wonder, like, with our crabs the way they are, has anybody ever talked about that? I don't know. I never really, you know, it's not something the news has honed in on, that's for sure. Well, in any case, uh, Zach, mind there for questions. Mike, did you have any other questions you were eyeballing that you wanted to address in specific? So I think this is a good one, too, from King John David Sr. What can be done about the impact of, uh, he lists a few invasives um, on the rock rockfish population, <clears throat> specifically the blue cats. Um, Pat, Pat do you, and Allison, do you guys mind taking this one? Because no, I know I, that you guys have been Yeah, I, I think it's, um, we have tried to increase harvest of um, blue cats through an uh, electrofishing program. Um, cause it's a much more efficient gear. Um, you can get where a lot of these guys fishing with, uh, traps can only bring in, you know, a little bit of catch each day with, with electric fishing, their, their quantities are much higher. Um, so it makes it more efficient. But one of the issues we are having is that, um, um, the USDA requires inspectors on the processing for these. And, um, it's a, it's a, a byproduct of, a Mississippi congressman who was trying to protect his catfish farms from import imported catfish. And it was never meant to be for wildly caught catfish. And, but we're now stuck with this where they have to have these inspectors. So there is kind of a, a, a little bit of a log gem there. It's like where processors are not going to want to do this unless they can have large quantities. Uh, Cause it's not worth having that, that, you know, processor there. And if they're there, then a certain amount of hours, they have to pay them over time. So, uh, but, we are looking you know, with our freshwater folks. They approached us about saying, "What can we do to increase, you know, catfish harvest?" Because it was they, our freshwater folks. We have a little bit of a conflict with them. It's that they have this world class um, trophy fishery for cat blue catfish on the James River, and they want to maintain that. But they've seen it decline in recent years because the juvenile and the sub adult biomass is so large that it's stunning the growth and affecting. You know, they don't have enough habitat available, so. They reached out to us. Um, snakeheads, you know, catch them and catch them and destroy, catch them, kill them and destroy them, eat them too. That's the only that I could say. You know, that's you know, they're here, but you know, if if catfish aren't going to make, you know, all you have to do is look what's happened with catfish and say that we probably should be doing something proactively with snakeheads right now. Yeah, in, in Maryland, uh, similar things have been done to try and expand the commercial fishing opportunities. We introduced um, catfish trot lines uh, a few years ago, and um, folks are fishing with catfish pots to try and, um, you know, harvest a, a lot of that biomass of blue catfish. But I just want to reiterate this, this um, FDA, USDA inspection issue that Pat 
um, talked about because it sounds kind of esoteric and kind of, you know, super in the weeds, but really what it means on the ground is the amount of fish that we can get harvested and processed is really limited. It has an upper limit because of these regulations. So this is something that CBF and, and I know CCA Maryland has also been working on to try and get um, the, those regulations changed or overturned to, to allow our processors to continue to cut more fish. But the good news is um, this is something that the individual angler can help with. Like Pat said, um, catch and harvest uh, for catfish, for snakeheads. In Maryland, our, our rockfish season is closed in a couple days for two weeks. And so if you want to still get out on the water and, and get some fishing time in, go catch some blue catfish um, and uh, take those home with you and, and eat them. And uh, that'll help contribute. But that's one that every every person on the call can help with. This is also a great time to mention the CCA Invasive Species Count, where if you register and it's free, you go into iAngler and you register for it. All you got to do is take a picture of the fish on a ruler and you send it into iAngler and your name gets put in a hat, right? You get entered for a drawing. If you gut the fish and take a picture of the stomach contents, they get more data. You get in the hat twice. And I know last year I won a cool little pair of clippers, little zipper clippers with CCA on. I was very excited. Okay. It was a pretty, pretty cool prize just for taking a picture of, I don't know if it was a blue cat or a snakehead or whatever and sending it in, but you can do it for blue cats, snakeheads, flatheads, and it costs mm -hmm. nothing to enter. And on top of that, you're also helping them gather data on where these fish are and how big they are and what they're eating. So very cool thing. Thanks Zach, for popping up that link, everybody, ccamd.org slash count. And again, it's free to enter. Like there's, there's, you know, no reason not to. All right, we got a question here for Mike. Drum and specs up and stripers down in the bay or invasions. Look, look, okay, so this is, this is uh, right up the alley of what we're talking about. Uh, are they having an impact on the anadromous species? Does it make a difference in which species we're talking about here? Well, they're just over. I mean, they're just great overlap in habitat there. Yeah. That <clears throat> that overlap. <laughs> I mean, it kind of seems like if you have an anadromous fish, it goes up the river, it spawns, it has babies, babies swim down the river. It's kind of like they've got to go through the the gauntlet. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, there's just perfect overlap and habitat there. I mean, it is temporal in nature mm -hmm. because that's a spring spawning run for the most part into the summer up north. But um, <clears throat> yeah, they got to go up the river. And then they've got to come back down. And of course, all the juveniles are really vulnerable as well. Um, and I, you know, I do, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. There. Yeah, I, I think I think they're having an impact on the endangered species more so than the, you know, drum and specs because, you know, the spatially, they're spatially separated. I mean, those drums and speck are going to be in the highest saline waters. It has been kind of amazing just how salty some of these fish have been showing up in too yeah They've i was gonna to say that lenny in maryland we're seeing blue cats kind of kind of everywhere mm -hmm. um yeah. uh you know so it, it's it's clear that they can tolerate a broad salinity and that's allowing them to just continue to expand and expand and expand um up the bay as well as you know up the tributaries of course as well absolutely so uh mike i finally caught up to you and got up this on the other screen, which I was scared to do before, honestly, because I thought I might have a disaster where I had the sound reverberating. But it turns out it's technically possible. So I spotted a question I like, too. And I want to see if we can get Zach to put up uh, David. I don't know how to say it. Z-A-G-N-O. David Zaggio? Um, I, I, wanna, I, I, I want to answer. Yeah, I want an answer to this question. Um is this a big, is this all a trophy thing? Like we, we know that, uh, we know that Virginia, you shut down the trophy season. Uh, Maryland has cut it back, but it's still there. But honestly, if you talk to the charter guys, they're all like, uh, gee whiz. Yeah. We sort of have a trophy season. They're not catching, you know, mm -hmm. certainly not enough to make them happy. I mean, what, what's the deal here with the trophy stripers versus all these other bits and pieces we're talking about well one thing is you're talking about a, a, a an individual fish that's you know getting ready to spawn you know it, it has already gone through the gauntlet so to speak so you know providing that 
protection similar to like what we do with red drum. We have a slot limit for red drum and anything. If, if it, it survives that gauntlet, it's protected. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we do protect those species, the, the, those fish, especially when, the you know, the spawning stack biomass is where it's at right now. Is there any fishery, recreational or commercial, other than Maryland trophy season, that doesn't have an upper slot limit at this point in time. Can you say the question again, Lenny? Is there yeah, any? So like in, in Maryland, there's no upper slot limit on mm -hmm. trophy stripers. On the coast, up and down the coast, you've got an upper slot. The fish runs the gauntlet, it's free, mm -hmm. right? Or, or you got to put it back. Virginia, in the bay, fish goes free if it's too big. Is there any other fishery, recreational or commercial, where those big trophy fish that survived the gauntlet still get pulled out of the water. <clears throat> so specific, so are you asking specific to rockfish or like sea trout? Yeah, specific, for specific to, to striped bass. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this was a, this was another question in the chat too. Uh, somebody referenced the year classes yeah, if relying on one or two year classes, why aren't our regulations stronger to protect those classes such as slot limits? It's a really good question. It's something that um, the managers explored some in Amendment 7, which was the most recent management action for striped bass. And it's something that some of the Chesapeake Bay delegation were supportive of looking into. Um, I don't think that's the last we'll hear of that. Uh, I do think that upper slots are effective and are being used in the the northern part of the fishery and and in other fisheries. I mean, look at look at Red Drum. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm I'm based down in North Carolina, and we have a great old Red Drum fishery um, in the New Salt Catch and Release, um, and that's really been a, a popular fishery for anglers um and so we've heard a lot of those references to red drum when stripers was and rockfish were going down the um slot limit discussion so i i think it's a valid um point i think it's something that the managers need to continue to discuss and look into um some of the challenges i'll just say scientifically it is difficult to measure the differences there of some of the slot limits because the increments can be so small in nature. So there are some scientific limitations to that, uh, to conducting that analysis, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, give those a try, especially if you guys caught the first um, episode of this series, you would have heard um, those guys talk a lot about <clears throat> the bigger females being more fecund and important in their reproduction. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a valid point. So this, this draws me into a two-part question. Uh, Pat and Allison, I think the two of you will probably know the answer to this one. In the states of Maryland and Virginia, does the commercial fishery have an upper slot? And if so... How like I mean they're fishing with nets like do the big fish that they put back really live? Do we know? The way we control that we control that by um, um, regulating the, the mesh size. So it, it's it you know the, by controlling that we can kind of control the size of the fish they're catching. So it's um, so we have we have regulations based on you know the mesh size as well. Well, I understand that that you can smaller miss smaller fish, but how do you let the bigger fish go while still catching the smaller fish? You see what I mean? Yeah. Um, season, you know, we we do also do it by you know uh, having restrictions. We have spawning uh, spawning area restrictions for harvesting. That's one of the way we do it during certain times of the year. Do we have any inkling on how well the fish that are too big to keep to get released do after they're released? There are some studies that show, I think the the commercial discard rate is, a, I think it's 4%. So I think what the stock assessment said. The, okay. The, okay. Yeah. Allison, is the same true in Maryland? Is that what we're looking at in Maryland? Well, thank you, Pat, for giving me a couple seconds to Google because I, I couldn't recall off the top <laughs> of my head. However, Was I right? 
Uh, well, I was looking it up for Maryland. I wasn't fact checking you. I was going to take your word for it. Um, for Maryland, there is a slot limit. It's 18 to 36 yeah. inches. Yeah. So Gabe, guess, sorry, is, Lenny, I was just going to mention Sikorsky put into the uh, comments that Mass Massachusetts has a commercial fishery on fish over 35 inches. And when I when I talked to Dan McKiernan about that, that was more of an enforcement. Um, the, the reason they did that was more for enforcement so they could easily separate commercial from recreational. But again, it uh, you know the question should be asked, uh, does it make sense to be putting fishing pressure on <clears throat> those large females? Right, right. Now, we do have a question that we have got to get up here because this is directly for you, Allison, from Steve Ag. Uh, whoop, wait a minute. Richard's, Richard Redler. And he's asking about the dead zone and the work CBF is doing to reduce the pollution coming in down the Susquehanna from Pennsylvania. I think we have to add New York to that, right? Oh, it's, it's not just Pennsylvania. I mean, the watershed goes way the heck up there. It's kind of shocking. So you want to address this? Uh, sure. Well, thank you for the question, Richard. I'll just throw that out there first. Um, so CBF is doing a lot of work in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have an office in Pennsylvania um, that works a lot with the General Assembly as well as folks on the ground. Obviously, one of the major contributors to um, nitrogen and phosphorus inputs to the Chesapeake Bay from Pennsylvania is agriculture, um, especially in the five counties sort of right there at the at the um along the Susquehanna, along the border of Maryland and Pennsylvania. And so uh, I believe either yesterday or a few days ago, there was um, a record amount of funding that the Pennsylvania legislature passed, which is going to go towards helping to clean up the Chesapeake Bay. And that was something that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation had worked really hard to support. Um, but also we're working directly with farmers to plant trees and uh, reduce nitrogen and phosphorus applications to agricultural lands. Um, but really, we, we found that um, trees are one of the most effective things that we can do. And planting trees in those areas uh, allows the trees to take up the excess nitrogen and phosphorus, slow the water down before it can get to the streams, before it can get to the Susquehanna and before it can get down to Maryland in the Chesapeake Bay. So um, CBF has, uh, for the past couple of years, embarked on this ambitious goal to plant 10 million trees in Pennsylvania before 2025. Um, and we're working really hard on that. So we've got our, our legislative work. We've got our work on the ground with farmers and uh, working with tons of partners in Pennsylvania to try and get as many trees in the ground as we possibly can. This, this goes right into the whole Conowingo thing. And I'm scared to even ask you about it, but how, how scared should we be at the prospect that we keep hearing about that Conowingo will no longer be trapping a lot of this gook coming down the Susquehanna? Well, that's why it's so important to address it before it gets to the Conowingo, right? Um, you know, the stuff that's being trapped behind the Conowingo, a lot of it is nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment that is getting into the Susquehanna higher in the watershed. So if we reduce the storm water that's bringing those things into the river, if we reduce the ag pollution, if we reduce the the stream erosion that's going on and taking and you know incising those stream banks and carrying sediment down with it, um, and stabilize those stream banks with trees, we can we can reduce the amount that we would have to rely on you know this man made uh, man made dam which is um, basically had this separate, completely separate and, and in incidental purpose <laughs> over the past 50 years, you know, it's made to hold back water, not to hold back all the sediment pollution that we're allowing to come down the river. So, um, so I think the, the efforts that we're all making further up in the watershed are what's going to be critical to, um, to the issues that are just manifesting themselves at the dam. Yeah. It's scary to think about what, what, could would happen when the dam is completely full and then of course i guess the flip side of that is it's already scary what happens when they get a big rainfall and the water just comes roaring down and we all know what happens i mean we can get a mud plume going clear down to the chop tank river it it, it can have a tremendous effect uh we did have another 
question on there uh, about a from Steve on questioning whether Virginia and Maryland have seriously considered a ban on netting during the peak of the spawn. Um, now that's a sticky one, I guess. I mean, during the peak of the spawn, they're already not netting, right? It's really prior to, I think. I, 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 mean, I, I, I just po I just posted it. The maximum size um, during the spawning season is is 28 inches from March 15th through June 15th in the bay, with a minimum size of 18. And that's on commercial, correct? Yeah. Um, so, so we're already kind of restricting, you know, the size of what they can keep. Yeah, and I believe Maryland and stop somebody stop me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, the, the peak of the spawn is not when the netting is going on; it's going on prior to. It's really over the winter when the fish are moving in, as I understand it. Is that? There's fishing a lot of the year. I mean, that's, but you know, that's you know, during that they, they can fish. The, the season is almost year round, but they can um, um, during that time period. I don't know. Somebody just put my comment up there that I had. That's it. But you know, th that right there is is designed to protect that spawning. You know, the larger females during the spawning season. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Clearly, I'm not as fast as Mike is at, at grabbing right. these comments. Uh, but I did have another one that I wanted to make sure that we covered and we haven't talked about yet. Uh, someone, one of the comments on there did ask about, you know, are the rockfish eating more crabs since they can't eat the bunker? And um, we've seen politicians in the past bring up, I remember when the croaker were around in big numbers and some brilliant politician on the eastern shore said oh we should raise the limit to 25 a day so they stop eating all the crabs and uh of course the croaker disappeared shortly thereafter but i have a personal pet worry that plays into this allison you might remember we've talked about it before but i, I i'm not sure if you'll remember it or not soft clams it's mm -hmm. like personally i treasure the soft clams i mean they're like I think the best bivalve on the face of the planet. And um, when the, in the fresh set, was it 2019, I think, that basically seemed to destroy them. And we haven't seen them come back. So it's yet another prey species that I think rockfish at one time used to eat a lot of, but we used to catch them with shell, crushed up shell mm -hmm. in their bellies. So what's going on on the soft land front? I mean, can we look to a recovery? Is it even going to help in this regard? Does it matter to the rockfish? Well, rockfish are, are kind of an opportunistic, um, you know, predator. And so they do, they do, you know, have a tendency to feed on the bottom or be a benthic uh, feeder. They'll eat worms. They'll eat clams. Um, they'll maybe they have, will eat crabs. But the thing to remember specifically to, to Steve's question is, you know, for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, crabs and rockfish have coexisted. Um, you know, there hasn't been a point in which even when we had the high abundance that we've seen in the bay before, they haven't gotten to a point where they wipe out um, blue crabs. So there's there's a natural uh, interaction in the Chesapeake Bay between these species, these predator and prey species. Um, the soft clams as well. I, I don't have my crystal ball. I can't say if and when they'll come back, but obviously a huge freshet um, like that, we there are concerns that you're wiping out a good amount of that brood stock, right? And uh, brood stock meaning, you know, those those female or the, uh, the adult clams that are going to be reproducing, if you wipe a lot of them out, it can be difficult um, or, or long term before they can come back. And the other thing about clams too is, they're, they're more ephemeral. They're not like an oyster that is in one place and established on an oyster reef that doesn't move. Uh, clams can shift around a little bit depending upon where their larvae settle out in, in the water. And so sometimes I hope that it's just, you know, we're, they have settled somewhere that's not the usual spot and, and somebody will find them again um, in a few years. Um, but I think we'll just have to wait and see on that front. Yeah, and Lenny, you mentioned you mentioned blue crabs and and striped bass, and um, the abundance of blue crabs is down right now. I mean, we we've seen we've had two of the worst years for juvenile recruitment 
measured by the winter dredge survey ever. Uh, the total abundance as a result of that was the worst ever in 2022. The males were bad as well. The only the only segment of the population that's is holding its own is is the spawning stock, which is what we manage on. And but even that took you know declined 40 percent versus last year. So uh, Maryland, Virginia just took some action as a result of that, lowering our bushel limits. And we're probably going to be taking further actions. Yeah, I, you know, uh, yeah, I, gosh, don't get me started on the crab limit. <laughs> I, 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 well, I got to tell you, as a recreational crabber, a uh, couple of years in a row now, it's been hard to get a bushel. Like, yeah. you don't have to tell me to stop at one bushel. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's not just, it's just not in the Chesapeake Bay, too. All I mean, this is becoming very remnant of what happened in the early 2000s, where, you know, blue crab populations up and down the coast were low. And, you know, from, from, you know, Georgia all the way up to, you know, Delaware abundances were low. So it, we may be going through another low cycle, you know, some kind of environmental, a decadal episode, as we said. So. Yeah. Decadal oscillation. I'm still stuck on that one. <laughs> I'm still totally stuck on that one. Um, so. Uh, tremendous conversation. Tremendously educational. One thing we have not really touched on is Joe Average Angler. Happened to be scrolling through Facebook and saw this and started watching it. And they're going, man, this is important. I care about this. What do I do? What can they do? I brought a list. Do you want me to start? Please. Oh, you go first. <laughs> uh yeah, so, you know, parts of our conversation this evening may have verged on depressing, may have, may have left people feeling a little bit defeated. But at the end of the day, there is a lot that, that every individual can do. Um, and so I want folks to, to really take away from this conversation is that things are rapidly changing around us. Um, our management frameworks don't change as quickly as the environment sometimes, and we may always be playing catch up. But while while ASMFC does its thing, while VMRC and DNR are doing their thing, there are things that, that each individual can do. So um, I did actually write down a list. So let me run through these real quick. Um, in Maryland, we have this great tool called Click Before You Cast. Um, and it's basically showing you the water quality conditions in any given place. So we talked earlier about how striped bass in particular can struggle with high water temperatures. DNR has this great um, social media tool where they tell you if it's a red, yellow, or green day, if it's a red day, fish for something else. Go go for blue cats. You know you'll probably get one. Um, you probably won't get, be skunked. So um, go for those blue cats. Go for those snakeheads. Um, volunteer CCA Maryland we talked about has the living reef action campaign they've kicked this off talking about building habitat in Cambridge Chesapeake Bay Foundation we're doing oyster restoration all the time trying to bring those habitats back and you can volunteer with any number of organizations in Maryland or Virginia to get on that habitat restoration train um, if you do catch a rockfish we we haven't really touched on this a lot tonight but um, it's a it's a theme. I hope most on the uh, on the broadcast are familiar with. Use your good fish handling techniques. Make sure that that fish makes mm -hmm. it back in the water alive. If that's if that's where it's going to go. And then my last my last thing is um, you know climate climate change is here to stay, and and our elected officials are the ones who are going to have to lead the charge in addressing not just the impacts but also the causes. And so. Um, I would say keep on your elected officials on. Uh, on mitigating those impacts because they're going to have a direct impact on what you get to experience on the water. Yeah. Dang, A plus, Allison. <laughs> Way to have a, a list ready. Um, so what I was thinking when this question came up was <clears throat> we all make personal choices when we're on the water and when we're going out fishing recreationally. <clears throat> and it, it really starts with the individual, as Allison was saying, you know, everyone plays a role, um, whether you're a catch and release angler or a harvester or just somebody that appreciates 
being out on the water in a, <clears throat> in a, in a recreational capacity, kayaking, whatever. And I think that if we can all just, it's kind of cliche, but work together to find solutions. And to me, that's really important. There's a really important component to getting us back to where we want to be. Um, and Allison mentioned the catch and release handling techniques. And what popped into my mind was that 90% uh, of every striped bass caught is released. So approximately nine out of every 10 striped bass that are caught are released. So think about that. Like the handling of fish, especially, especially in the Chesapeake Bay, where the water temperature is high and we know that they're stressed from that high water temperature and lower dissolved oxygen, oxygen level. The handling is really important. <clears throat> the less handling, the better. CCA Maryland has some guidance on this. I'm sure CBF has guidance on it. We worked with On the Water up in New England to put out some educational videos on it. Um, <clears throat> so there, there are resources out there. Um, <clears throat> If I can just jump in with you, Mike, I just, just want to make sure everybody knows if you go to fishtalkmag.com and type release into the search box, you'll get all kinds of good stuff on proper catch and release techniques. Lenny's got stuff on it. So, it's I mean, there, there's there. a lot of, yeah. Um, <laughs> who doesn't love a great Lenny video, right? But, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, um, there's a lot of information out there. Get engaged. Get involved. Um, you know, like I said, it's cliche to say we're all in this together and we need to, to work together to rebuild it. But um, it all starts with the individual. And, and I, we appreciate everybody kind of tuning in to listen to this. But there's a lot more beyond what we talked about. Um, and, you know, geeks like us get really fired up on these policy discussions and in science um, <clears throat> discussions. But honestly, we're we're everyone's in this for the resource and the opportunity that that resource brings. And so get involved, you know, get, get involved and be, be an educated and knowledgeable angler or participant. Um, and I think that's the best that you can do uh, to, to do what, what we all can to rebuild the resource. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go with similar to what Mike was saying was getting involved. It's a, you know, if you wait until either the Virginia Marine Resources Commission or ASMSC are doing a final decision, it's too late. You, know, you need to get involved early. We have this way too many times. We don't hear anything from anybody until we're going before our board or, or even afterwards. We, we approve a, a change and they go, well, I never heard about this. You know, in today's society, I mean, you know, with this kind of avenue where it's 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 recorded, you, you don't have to drive halfway across the state to go to a public hearing anymore. All of our public meetings, all of ASMFC meetings are, are broadcast live. There's numerous opportunities for public hearing. And some folks say, well, I'm not going to do it because my, you're not going to listen to me. We will listen to you, you know, in the early stages, but you can't show up the last night and expect everything to be changed after two years of working on, on getting something done. And that's what I tell folks is that, Get involved early. That's when the that's when your voice is going to be heard the best because you know that's when everybody's every every idea is a good idea or, or, or is going to be considered. When you get to a certain point, you whittle it down to just a few options, and you know it, it's 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 very hard for you to come in the room at, at that late stage and and try to influence the decision. So get involved early and often. I'll I'll bet we see that changing. And I say that because I was at a uh, MREP course not long ago. Thank you, Dave Sikorsky, for getting me into that. Very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the guests who was actually from the Maryland DNR mentioned, okay, COVID's kind of winding down, but we think we're going to continue doing the meetings virtually because so many more people participate. And I was like, thank you. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it is so much easier for Joe Angler to tune into these meetings when they can do it on the yeah. computer the next day. They don't have to try and leave work an hour early and God forbid, find something to eat before they get to the meeting. Uh, I think we may see real progress in that direction moving forward. I certainly hope so. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. And uh, I'll just jump in Lenny and say, 
um, you know, we're fortunate enough to work on this full time and like myself in terms of industry, myself, Dave Sikorsky, like Allison, we're, we all put our heads together when these, these really complicated management documents come out and we, we put out guidance to the community to help them understand the complexities that are being discussed. Like what's the status of the resource? Why is this action being taken and really distill it down? Um, so, you know, feel free to interact with us. And we, we try to keep our community very engaged and educated to pr provide the input that Pat and the rest of the board are looking to have when they go to make these decisions. And we try to do that early and often. So I know CCA has a place on the website. You can go there, you can click, you can sign up, you get the alerts, you get the messages. Does ASA have a similar? We do, it's called keepamericafishing.org. Um, and so if you go on there, you can sign up for alerts. And that is our platform that we use to educate uh, the angling community about these management issues and how to get involved on them. Okay. And CBF is a slightly different organization. Obviously it's not all fish heads, but is there a similar type of, you know, alert me community involvement way to, to work with CBF? Yes, absolutely. So um, CBF also engages on a lot of these fisheries issues. Um, you can go to cbf.org and get our newsletter and you'll get emails right to your inbox. Or if you go to cbf.org and click Action Center on the top right of the page, it'll take you down to all of the active issues that we're working on where you can comment directly to maybe it's the legislature, maybe it's Maryland DNR, VMRC. Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. We will have information for you there, background on the issue, as well as some, some draft language that you can uh, send to the appropriate management agency at that time. Cool, now Pat, for an angler in Virginia, VMRC is obviously a very different kind of organization, mm -hmm. but I believe you can sign up to get press releases that do alert you of upcoming meetings, right? We do, and we also have it, you know, um, unfortunately, we do not have a public information officer. We have not had one since I've been here for over four years now, and we've been begging for one. So I'm going on the record to beg for one again, because uh, what we end up having to do is the staff have to do it, and, we, and we're not really trained to get all do those kind of things. But, you know, we put things on Facebook. Uh, all of our meetings are advertised on Facebook well in advance. They're on our website as well. Um, all of our advisory committees, the same thing with the with the minutes and the, and the agendas as well. And we usually have a contact person for each one of those. All of our meetings are also they're broadcast live and they're, and they're stored on YouTube. So you can watch any one of our meetings, uh, whether whether it's a simple, you know, RFAB, which is just looking at giving out recreational money to fishing groups to, you know, striped bass, you know, the big striped bass meetings we had or to our Menhaden Management Advisory Committee. You know, all of those are stored online. You can watch every one of them if you want. And people do it all the time. And we'll, I'll get references, you know, three hours and 36 minutes and 15 seconds into this meeting, you said this. Okay, I guess I did. So, you know, but we can do, I, I wish we did a better job, but, you know, we do get that information out. We, we try our best. And, um, you know, but, you know, we, we send out emails to everybody as well when we can. Now we do have at the Maryland DNR, of course, we don't have a Maryland DNR rep here, but I know from experience, they do have uh, PR people there. No. Um, and you can sign up for DNR emails. You'll get a lot of them. You'll yeah. get a lot, but you can sign up for them and they will include the important stuff uh, as well as a lot of stuff that might not you know, necessarily interest anglers so much, um, but it's worth, signing, it's, it's worth dealing with all the emails just to see exactly what the heck is going on um now interestingly my my technical savvy hit a brick wall when facebook froze up for me so <laughs> i can't even see if there are any more dramatically important questions on there but we are bumping right up against the 8 30 deadline so i'm gonna have to ask folks if we haven't gotten your questions stay tuned uh we can address them in the comments after the fact but we really need to wrap up at this point. Um, you know, uh, most importantly, I want to thank our panel for being there. Thank you all so much. This has been a truly fascinating conversation. I mean, it really has. I know I learned an awful lot today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank 
Dave Sikorsky and Chris Dollar for coming up with this whole Chesapeake perspective concept in the first place. And then for, you know, going the extra mile to really push and make sure it happened. I want to send out a big thanks to Zach Dittmars for standing behind the curtain and pulling all the levers. <laughs> um, you know, we, we couldn't do it without him. That is for sure. And uh, don't forget, people, uh, we have another episode coming up. We'll talk about the future of the fishery. Uh, that's coming up on September 22nd. That'll be uh, the final piece of the puzzle we're going to talk about. We'll talk about rebuilding the fishery and getting to a bay that the future anglers deserve. Now, that's a long way off. And I know it's easy to forget the date between now and then. Trust me, I'll forget it five times between now and then. So if you haven't already signed up, uh, make sure you sign up for the updates. Uh, they're they're going to uh, go out prior to. Can we get the, oh, we, we already got the link up. I got it covered up. So Zach's already got the link up there. That's where you can sign up. You'll get an email beforehand. And uh, one other thing I want to mention is that the CBF Reef Slam is coming up. And uh, that is a really fun tournament event. Uh, I had a great time with it in the past. I'm going to do it again this year. It's it's the only spe uh, tournament I know of where you catch, you compete to catch the most species, not the biggest fish. And uh, Allison, there's one really cool new thing for, for this year. Should I let, leave it to you to tell people what's different this year? Is this a quiz? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole Virginia thing. Because like in the oh, yeah, that's we're what just not new this year. We did it last year too, but there's a oh. there's there's a Virginia Rod and Reef Slam this year in September. The Maryland Rod and Reef Slam is back for our fifth year, um, October 8th through the 16th. Whether you fish in Maryland or Virginia, both are gonna end with a nice big party on the beach, food drinks, live entertainment. It's going to be a great time. And we're celebrating habitat and all of the species diversity that comes with that. We've got an invasive species division in Maryland. So if you want to go for that big blue cat or that big uh, snakehead, you can get uh, prizes for that too. So hopefully everybody will come out. CBF.org slash slam will get you to the Maryland tournament. CBF.org slash VA slam will get you to the Virginia tournament. And uh, we hope to see plenty of you guys out on the water. So, you know, I kind of blew that there. I thought this year was new, but it was last year. Okay. But as we sign off, I just want to let people know one thing. The first one ever was a real eye-opener for me because we did all our fishing in Harris Creek, which had just gotten completed a monstrous oyster restoration program, right? Big, big, big change. And I'm going to tell you what, people. Honest to God, I sight casted for rockfish in Maryland water. Now, I never thought that would be possible in my lifetime, but it just goes to show you what can happen when you get the oysters back in the water. How, Allison, how many oysters are in Harris Creek now? Like eight gazillion billion? <laughs> eight gazillion billion. I believe there was over two billion oysters planted, 350 acres of, oyster, of new oyster reef habitat there in Harris Creek. Well, I can tell you this, it made a difference. I literally sight cast it for rock. I didn't think it would ever happen in my whole life. All right. Well, thank you all again. Thank you folks for tuning in. And please join us next time, September 22nd, for our final installment. Take care now. Bye-bye. Go fishing. See ya. <laughs>